Espírito. E esse é o My check, my check, 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 check. My check, my check, 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 check. All right, good people, great people, guys, people, good people. Great people, God's people. Welcome to another episode, the last episode of Professor Odie's. They ain't to the, well, the last episode for the season. Don't freak out. The last episode for the season of Professor Odie's, the antidote. And um, I'm doing a couple of different things with this stream, man. Um, I'm rocking with, you know, uh, the Instagram live stream. I'm also rocking with the YouTube live stream. Hopefully everything is doing what it is that I need to do. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, hopefully everything is streaming the way that I need it to stream. If not, well, it's going to be very interesting. How this is going to look moving forward. You dig what I'm saying? Uh, it's going to be real interesting, y'all. This episode is going to be real interesting. <clears throat> this episode that we're doing is called Pack Light. And I hope everybody on Instagram can hear me. Uh, if not, damn. <laughs> That's what I get for trying something new. But um, yeah, man, you always got to take a risk. You always got to take a risk. Um, but once again, good people, great people, guys, people. Today's episode is called Pack Light, um, Relationships and Trauma. And I decided to do this episode this way because I felt like it would be pretty cool to, you know what I'm saying, have a conversation around the way in which I believe that relationships nowadays, especially the way that it is that we look at it on social media, the way that it is that we engage, you feel what I'm saying, is... <sighs> y'all y'all see what's going on, man. Y'all see how it is that we do in these relationships. Y'all see how it is that we really not, you know what I'm saying? Uh, how can I say? We're really not having the conversation in such a way that's a honest conversation, right? We're not having the conversation in such a way where we are being completely truthful with why it is and how it is that things are transpiring the way that it is that they're transpiring um, in our relationship dynamics. And a lot of times when I watch what's on, whether it be clips on YouTube, whether it be TikTok, Instagram, all of the platforms that I'm a part of, man, what I see is a lot of bullshit. <laughs> As a clinician, I'm just going to be very honest with you, man. What I see is a lot of bullshit. And why I say it's a lot of bullshit is because people are telling half of a story, right? Usually when people get on these platforms, what they are talking about and what they are presenting is, oh, you know, this is the type of relationship that I want. This is how it is that I want my relationship to go. This is X, Y, and Z, and A, B, and C. But very rarely are we talking about the dynamics of not only just trauma, but also how it is that we tend to protect ourselves with our ideal relationship dynamics. So... Before we get into that, man, before we get into that, um, I really want to thank y'all for rocking with me for two seasons, man. It's been a great, great, great trajectory. It's been crazy how it is that we've been, you know what I'm saying, going crazy on Instagram. I don't know about TikTok because TikTok can hold me. But going crazy on Instagram, man, we, we grew 34,000 followers in a year. You feel what I'm saying? Went from 10K last year to now met 44.8K. So I appreciate y'all, man, sincerely. None of this can happen without y'all, right? And once again, it's the holiday season. So, of course, this is going to be the last episode for the year and the last episode of this season. And, you know, we're going to come back probably around February, March. Depending on how I'm feeling, you dig know what I'm saying? I got I to gotta get all these clips out. Like, y'all, when I say I got, it's, I got 60, this will be the 66th episode of this podcast. The 66th, right? So I got mad episodes, I got mad clips in the goddamn folders that I can release. I got a whole bunch of stuff for y'all to continue to watch and to continue to engage in on different platforms. So just because I'm not going to be producing any more new content for the next couple of months doesn't mean that you all are not going to be able to go through some of my, you know what I'm saying, my old school stuff or some of my 
more recent stuff and still be able to have the conversations that y'all enjoy having in the comments, still be able to, you know what I'm saying, have the debates, still be able to engage in, you know, the very fruitful uh, dialogues that I see in my <laughs> YouTube love. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like, you know, we got to do what we got to do to get where it is that we need to go. And if necessary, like, I'll mess around with the mess around. And if this episode don't stream the way that I need it to stream, it, you know, I got it uh, on Instagram. So turn around, you know, record it. Whoop the bam, do what I need to do. You feel me? If it look too bad, I take it off of YouTube. But I, I doubt, I doubt that it'll be that, that, that bad. You dig what I'm saying? Um, but no, man, yeah, like, like I said before, this is gonna be the last episode of the year, uh, the last episode of this season. And like I said, y'all, I got 66 episodes of this joint. Y'all can go back on my YouTube. Y'all can run through it. You feel what I'm saying? Y'all can see what's going on. And it's a lot of conversations. Oh, no. It said, YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming and such viewers will experience buffering. Ah, this is hurting my feelings. Not YouTube not doing the thing that I needed to do. But like I said, this is the reason why we always got multiple streams going on in multiple places. Y'all got to listen. Technology is going to technology. You dig what I'm saying? But no, man. So we're going to continue rolling. Um, we're going to continue rolling with the episode on Instagram. So if y'all on YouTube right now and YouTube's not doing what it needs to do, head on over to Instagram because we're still on Instagram. We're still going crazy. But yeah, man, tonight's episode is called Relationships and Trauma. Pack a light, right? So as I was saying in the intro, it's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of bullshit. A lot of bullshit in the relationship dynamic, in the relationship conversation on social media and on other platforms, right? Um, and I'm not necessarily a fan of it, right? I don't necessarily enjoy how it is that we will come onto these platforms and we'll say stuff like, I want this type of relationship. I'm expecting this from this type of person. I'm looking for it to go this particular type of way. And we are not being honest with what it is and how it is that we need our, you know, internals to be situated before we start going into relationships. So what do I mean? A lot of us, a lot of us utilize our ideal relationship dynamics in order to protect us from the relationship trauma that we've experienced, right? So as a clinician, I work with both couples and singles, or I work with both couples and individuals. And in a, in a lot of, a lot of people's relationship expectations, there are things that they have not experienced before but there are also things that they have experienced that they would like to experience the opposite of. So, for example, there are a lot of men who want a woman who is not argumentative, who is, you know what I'm saying, submissive, who is, doesn't have a lot of, you know what I'm saying, a lot of bodies, X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. And a number of these things, when I listen closely enough, is because a number of these men have experienced women or who have experienced relationships where they have had a partner who has not supported them emotionally, who where they have been cheated on, right? Or they have been seeking partnerships that are not necessarily the most beneficial to the emotional disposition or the emotional needs that they have as a man. So when they go into their next relationships or when they go into the dating space, what happens is, is that they come with these very unrealistic expectations about not necessarily what type of woman that they are going to run into, but the qualifiers of what a quote unquote good woman is, right? Similarly with women, one of the things that I see a lot, of, a lot from women is like, oh, I want an emotionally intelligent man. I want a man who's going to be able to, you know what I'm saying, pay for this, do this, X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C, because they've experienced shit to your men. They've experienced men who are at the bottom of the barrel. They've experienced men who have not been able to facilitate what it is that they say that they can facilitate, right? So when they go into the relationship sphere, once again, or when they go into the dating sphere, there are so many qualifiers that rule out people or men in the dating sphere that they just believe that there are no good men or they just believe that the men, they're, they're just pissing the dating pool. Now, let me be very clear. Let me be extremely clear. Right, as a relationship therapist and as an individual clinician, there is piss in the dating pool. <laughs> there just is. Like social media has had an impact. You understand what I'm saying? People's trauma has had an impact. But 
the main like the main parts of the piss that's in the dating pool is people throwing their trauma and people trauma dumping into the dating pool, right? People expecting their partner to pick up the slack or to clean up the mess that another partner previously created, right? There are a number of people who are looking for either women or men to do the opposite of what a previous partner did so that they can feel healed, they can feel complete, they can feel as if though, you know what I'm saying, what it is that I'm thinking about this opposite gender is not necessarily the right thing. Or I want this person to come in and, you know, resolve me or remove me of the relationship trauma that I've experienced in the past so that I can no longer be weighted down by the reality that I've experienced this trauma. Now, here's the very interesting thing about all of these things. I did an episode previously called You Look For What You Lack, right? And when I say that, what it is that I mean is that you are looking for the things that you did not have either in your childhood or you are looking for things that you did not have in previous relationships. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. Right. I'm not saying that you looking for these things in relationships is something that you should not be looking for. But what I tell my clients all the time is that you can keep your standards, but modify your expectations. A lot of times the things that we expect in the dating realm are exaggerated versions of what we will accept. Right. So Keir Gaines said something. Shout out Keir Gaines. Keir Gaines said that we operate between the ideal and the non-ideal. A lot of people will shoot for the ideal, but when they don't get that ideal, they become upset, right? They believe that somehow somebody is withholding something from them, or they just believe that this perfect ideal is something that they will be able to obtain. My thought on that is that people look for that perfect ideal because they do not want to deal with the discomfort and the pain that comes with meeting somewhere in the middle. Right. They do not want to yield. They do not want to give. They do not want to, you know, compromise. Why? Because they feel like, oh, I've compromised so much before. Why should I have to compromise now? What you did before was not compromise. It was self-betrayal. I'm going to say it again. What you did before was not compromise. It was self-betrayal. And there's a difference. Compromise is you standing on business and saying, you know what? Although this is not what it is that I would prefer, I am willing to take this concession or I am willing to take this L in order to get this W in exchange. Self-betrayal is I'm just going to dispose of all of my boundaries. I'm going to dispose of all of my expectations and I'm going to take you as you are because you have one or two qualities that I feel are attractive to me. And to be quite honest, I firmly believe that men engage in self-betrayal way more than women do. <laughs> men engage in self-betrayal way more than women do. For a lot of men, the reason why they've had the relationship experiences that they've had is because they go in relationships dick first. Hey, I'm a man, G. I didn't see it. Right, A lot of men do not learn relationship discernment until they've gotten through a number of women who they started fucking and then they got into a situationship and that woman harmed them in that situationship and then they moved out of the situationship then having this baggage that they're carrying saying that women ain't shit. Right? Women do something similar but in my experience, I've seen that men do it more often. Why? Because men have more of a problem verbalizing what it is that they want in relationships, right? Men have more of an issue identifying what it is that they want in committed relationships, right? So when men come onto these platforms and they come onto these podcasts and they begin saying, oh, I want a woman with this, you know what I'm saying? I want a woman with a low body count or I want a woman who's going to cook, clean, X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. It's because they did not require those things at the front of their previous situationships. Or they did not require those things at the front of what it is that they were doing previously. So they got to a point where the woman that they was fucking, they decide, oh, this is the woman that I, you know what I'm saying, have some type of feelings for. Or this is the woman that I have some type of enamoring or enamorment, if that's a word. I, I am enamored by this woman. So now I want to see whether or not I can cajole her into doing these skills. That's, that's foolish. 
<laughs> that's foolish, right? It is something that a number of men do. And then when that woman is not able to reciprocate those things, they become upset, right? They become hard. They become, they start acting funny, right? Because once again, men have a more difficult time expressing their needs in relationships than women do. So it's much easier for men to, to kick up dust. It's much easier for men to step out and cheat. It's much easier for men to say, no, we're not in a relationship. Then it is for him to identify the needs that he wants in a committed relationship and take the risk for him to potentially be harmed in that dynamic, right? Now, in my experience with women, <laughs> Stormy said it, uh, shout out Stormy P, the Chocolate Chip and Sip podcast, you know what I'm saying? Stormy said, the reason why so many issues in the relationship uh, dynamic or the, the, the dating dynamic now is because ain't nobody standing on business. Right, a woman to say, "Oh, I want this from a man. I want this from a man. I want this from a man." And all it takes is for a man to be over six feet with a pretty smile, a beard, and a gold chain. Now, all of a sudden, all your standards out the window. Hey, ladies, y'all are complicit in this dynamic, right? And I firmly believe that for a lot of women, a lot of women, they will not admit. That things get their panties wet or things get them all enthralled. Like women are sexual beings too, right? Women are sexual beings as well. The difference is, is that women are more likely, in my mind, to verbalize what it is they're looking for in a relationship. Or they are more likely to begin, quote unquote, dropping hints as to what it is that they would like. Now, there are two things in this dynamic. The first thing is that whole dropping hint shit. Ladies, that is low tier manipulation. That is low tier manipulation. And hold on, before you get your thong in your booty hole, let me explain what's going on. The reason why I say it's low tier manipulation is because for a number of you all, what will happen is, is that when you drop these hints and this man does not understand these hints, you will get upset. You will become angry. You will attempt to punish this man and you will attempt to, once again, become annoyed or angered with this man because he did not pick up what you were putting down. Ma'am, I'm not going to say that men are stupid. Men are straightforward. You have to ask for what it is that you want, right? You have to ask for what it is that you desire, straight up and straight out, right? That's the drop and hints part. The other part is you're verbalizing what it is that you want to a man has up. To a man who has already told you he's not going to do it. You are trying to cajole yourself into a position where this man is all of a sudden going to do for you what it is that you want him to do for you because your pussy is just that magical, baby. It's not. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it's not. Your coochie is not that fantastic. It just is not. Right. I've had conversations with men where men have told me straight up, I've told this woman, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And I'm not doing this. And that woman will come in and try to change all of those things as if though I am willing to all of a sudden change my outlook or my, my, my life trajectory for her. That is the equivalent. And ladies, hear me when I say this, that is the equivalent of you saying to a man that you're not going to do something and him attempting to manipulate you into doing it. It is crossing a boundary. Right? So, now that we've identified both the man's and the woman's complicitness in this entire dynamic, what do these things mean, Odie? How do these things come to pass? Why do these things operate this way? Everybody's fucking traumatized. Especially black folks. Everybody is goddamn traumatized, right? And what do I mean by this? What do I mean by this? For a lot of us as black men and black women, us verbalizing our needs to our parents, our contemporaries, our peers, before the need was met, the need was questioned or minimized. This is what I mean. Here's an example. Mom, Dad, I'm feeling X, Y, and Z. Ooh, Mom, Dad, I'm feeling depressed. Mom, Dad, I'm feeling sad. Mom, Dad, I'm feeling angry. 
Mom, Dad, I'm feeling this emotion. What we usually get in return? You better go depress them dishes. Right? Oh, what you feeling? It don't mean shit. You being mad don't mean nothing. There's bills to pay in this house. X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. That communication dynamic sets up a precedent where as an adult, you believe that your needs are already too much. Right? You believe that your emotions are difficult to deal with. You believe that even if you ask for something, your need is not going to get met. There are a number of black men and there are a number of black women who suffer from hyper-independence, right? That hyper-independence comes from being in environments where their parents, being in environments where their peers, being in environments where people were not dependable, not necessarily because they did not want to be dependable, but because the resource for them to be dependable, whether it be time, energy, money, labor, was not present, right? And instead of that parent saying, I don't have the time, or instead of that parent saying, I don't have the money, instead of that parent saying, I don't have this, or I don't have that, I firmly believe that a number of our black parents felt deep and immense shame for not being able to give their children what it is that they wanted to give their children. And instead of processing that internal shame, they lashed out. Right? Our parents became upset. Why are you even asking me for this? What makes you believe that you deserve this and I didn't even get it? If I didn't get it, you my king, you my child, what makes you think that you gonna get it? Right? There are some parents who were not physically present. Right? So we don't even know what it means for this parent to show up. We don't even know what it means for this parent to be present. We don't even know what it means for this parent to come and give us what it is that we are looking for. Right? We don't know what it means. We don't. Some of us had fathers who showed up when they wanted to. Some of us had uncles and aunts who were transient in our lives, came in, gave us a little bit of money, left, and believed that that's what was necessary in order to raise a child. Right? Some of us had parents who believed that all they had to do was give money. Right? All they had to do was do a little ditty, show up, hey, how you doing? I'm your daddy, I'm your mom, and then, you know what I'm saying, skedaddle, do whatever it is they was doing before. Right? That sets up a foundation for a precedent that makes you believe that you are not worthy to stay around for. Right? It sets up a precedent for you to continue to engage in begging behaviors or engage in abandonment, uh, the fear of abandonment, right? It drives you to engage in anxious avoidant or avoidant behaviors because once again, you're so used to people being transient that you don't even want to attach to people, right? So once again, that's where them commitment issues come in. That's where those inability to connect comes in, right? That's where that, oh, as soon as you do something wrong, I'm finna we walk the band, I'm finna be out the jam. That's where that comes from. Right? On the other hand, we may have had parents that were physically present but were emotionally absent. Right? Parents that only engaged with you in a negative, in a loud, and in a violent way. Right? Parents who only gave you attention when you were doing negative things. Or parents who only gave you feedback when you were doing something that you had no business, right? So to boss up and beat you parents, right? No love. No, you did a good job. No, oh, you did this well. None of those things, right? It was the parent who came in as the disciplinarian, who came in as the, oh, this is what you need to do, who came in as the, oh, I don't give a damn about what it is that you're feeling. I don't give a damn about you crying. I don't care about none of that. Do what it is that I ask you to do. Right? So once again, that sets up a precedent for you to withdraw. That sets up a precedent for you to not believe that this person is here for you. It sets up this precedent for you to have 
or to need constant reassurance that for some people feels like clinginess, right? It leads you to believe that you need to be around your partner all the time. Otherwise, this partner is going to, once again, not be present, right? If they had a choice, they wouldn't be here. So light of me allowing them their own space, I'm just going to be around them all the time, right? You have other parents who were enmeshed in their children's lives, right? And when I say enmeshed, enmeshed means the lack of boundaries, lack of space, and lack of rigid, once again, defining characteristics between parent and child, right? So those parents who were in your business all the time, and when I say in your business, I don't necessarily mean, hey, tell me what's going on. No, 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 no. I mean, your parent was damn near your best friend, right? Your parent was coming to tell you about the shit that was going on in their lives and how their lives was fucked up, right? Your parent was coming to you to help or for help with regulation, help with, you know what I'm saying, stabilizing themselves, help with understanding how it is to navigate the world. You had to grow up faster than you wanted to, right? So that sets up a precedent and a foundation in your dating space for you to infantilize your partner, right? You just somebody else I got to raise. You're another bill. You're another liability. All of these different things come from these different types of traumas that we potentially could have experienced in our childhoods or in our younger years, right? But most people think that, you know, your attachment style is a, uh, is a death sentence, right? Most people believe that your attachment style is something that, once again, <laughs> is constant. It's something that you're always going to deal with. It's something that you're always going to engage in. And that's not necessarily true, right? But... We're going to get to that point in a minute. There are also people who believe that childhood trauma is the only trauma that impacts your relationship dynamics over time. That is the farthest thing from the truth, right? Midlife relationship trauma, the trauma that we experience when we first begin dating, right? The trauma that we experience when we are literally going out here, taking these emotional risks, engaging with these people, learning, being harmed, taking it on the chin, all of these different things, right? So what I've noticed from not only just my clients, but a lot of people on platforms, Instagram, you know what I'm saying, all of these different, uh, all of these different platforms, is that when they begin talking about relationships specifically, what they begin talking about are the things that they've experienced in the past that have harmed them so deeply that they have not taken the time to process through them or have harmed them so deeply that now what they are attempting to do is that they are attempting to shield themselves from experiencing this type of harm, right? So for example, one of my favorite examples is extreme possessiveness. My man can't do this. My man can't do this. My I, I, I was watching uh, I was watching a podcast clip, and I can't remember what podcast it was. I think it was either Tequila Talk or one of them one of the podcasts that be in Atlanta, right? And <laughs> the girl was like, "If you weren't my friend, I wouldn't allow you around my man. Why? My man can't have no big booty friends." What? So the other podcast host was like, "Yo, that's mad possessive," and the woman was like, "You're right. You are absolutely right, and I don't care." I am very possessive of my man, right? There are a number of men who will say, once I get with this girl, she can't go to the club no more. She can't go on no girls' trips, X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. Wow, good brother. That's why, right? Why do you believe that? Oh, because her friends are some hoes, and they're going to da 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 X, Y, and Z, and A, B, and C. Hmm. So the trauma that both of you all are speaking from is the trauma of infidelity trauma of somebody cheating on you, right? Another great, another fantastic example, fantastic example, is this body count conversation, which 
is hilarious to me because this is just more on the men's side than on the woman's side. But with men, the body count conversation is a direct correlation to the fear of not being the man, right? Or the fear of not being the person who is knocking this woman uterus from wall to wall, right? It is a deeply, it is a deeply masculine fear of not being the person who your woman wants to be attached to 365 days a week. I mean, 365 days a year, seven days a week, right? I want to be the biggest dick that you ever had before, even though, even though, even though, most men know that they were not the biggest dick that, that their woman has had. But he don't want her around no more dicks. Why? Because that dick might be bigger than mine. Straight up, right? I was watching another podcast. I think it was the Basement Podcast. I forget the pastor's name. But, oh boy, he went super viral. He said, listen, a lot of y'all, if, if y'all wives were really, if y'all wives were really to start talking, if y'all wives were really to start telling y'all about y'all selves, you would not be able to take it, right? She didn't have eight inch pain before and she settled for five, right? She didn't engage with different types of men before and she settled for you. So y'all will talk about, oh, she didn't gain weight. Oh, she didn't did this, she didn't did that. My bad, y'all. She didn't did this, she didn't did that. Oh, she didn't ah da 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 But she settled for you out the gate from jump. And now she's dealing with these relationship traumas that come from settling with somebody that you didn't even really, not necessarily you didn't want to be with, but you kind of compromised, right? Oh, I'm getting old. It's time for me to settle down. It's time for me to get married, right? There are a number of men who are extremely traumatized by that. Extremely. Why? Because they've had women chew them out the asshole. Chew them out. Because they started getting big and bad, and then that woman had to shut him down, right? So now going into the dating sphere, he's like, I don't want a woman with too much experience because she may have had more experience than I am able to match, right? All of these things extend from relationship trauma, you guys. All of these things extend from the trauma that is experienced throughout what it is that we engage in in relationships. Right. So when we talk about this whole idea of packing light, right, when we talk about this whole idea of, you know, beginning to heal this relationship trauma or beginning to, you know, equalize some of our relationship expectations or begin to equalize some of our relationship demands. I think one of the most profound things that I use in my relationship therapy or I use in my uh, dating coaching is the same thing that David Mann said on an interview. He said that when I'm talking to women and they bring me their lists, uh, he said that, okay, it's okay for you to have a list. Write down everything that you want on this list. Write everything that you want from a man. After you look at this list, I want you to ask yourself, how many things on this list do I already embody? Right? How many things on this list am I already? Am I already this type of person? Or am I looking for this type of person so that I do not have to be this person? I'm going to say that one more time. For those of you all who have lists, it is okay for you to have this list. It is fine. Right? When you look at this list, I want you to go back through this list and I want you to look at every single one of the identifiers on this list. How many of these identifiers on your relationship list do you already embody? If you do not embody a lot of them, I am here to tell you, you got a lot of audacity. Because what you are doing is that you are looking for somebody to be these things. so that you do not have to be them. You are operating on this premise that your partner is supposed to complete you. No. Your partner is supposed to add to you. Your partner is supposed to be an addition. Right? Which leads me to my next point. On this list, if you do not have 
a lot of these wants or you do not have a lot of these factors, then your job is to continue to work on these factors, right? Because how can you identify the worth of something that you have not worked on, right? How can you truly identify that this is what it is that you need or want when you have not engaged in it yourself, right? You are asking for a lot without being willing to give the same amount of energy. That's wildly audacious, right? Have you learned how to identify when somebody is triggering you, why that trigger exists, how that trigger manifests in your space, and how you are going to continue to engage past that point? So in other words, have you learned how to regulate, right? Have you learned how to self-regulate? Have you learned how to not run when being presented with a piece of difficulty, right? Have you learned how to not be in a space of withdrawal or a space of reactivity when somebody has triggered you, right? Because, oh, I'm real quick to cut these motherfuckers off. That's a trauma response. Sorry to tell you. It's a trauma response. If you quick to cut people off, that is the other side of you not wanting to connect too thoroughly because of all of the things that you've experienced previously. Right? And once again, I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. I'm not. What I'm saying is, is that engaging in dating from a perspective of I'm going to protect myself does not allow you to engage in the fullness and the thriving parts of finding a partner that will benefit you or finding a partner that will be beneficial for you that will add to you, right? Another thing, there are some people, there are some people, whether it be man or woman, who truly believe, who truly believe that social media is the extent of the dating realm, that social media is the extent of how people think about dating. That social media is the breeding ground for where it is and how it is that people get their dating ideas. Now, I'm going to be very clear. Very, 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 very clear. Right? Fellas, if you want to engage with these women in 2023, you need to become a more well-rounded individual. Straight up and down. You cannot expect... These women to cook, clean, suck, and fuck, and you not doing none of it in return. I'm going to say this one more time. You cannot expect these women to cook, clean, suck, and fuck, and you are not doing the same thing in return. Right? So, for example, when I go on TikTok, when I go on Instagram, and I scroll through my Explore page, and I see men cooking and cleaning... I can almost guarantee you, guarantee, there are thousands of women in those comments. Oh my God, can you feed me some? Oh my God, your house looks so clean. I just want, I bet it smells so good. I just want to go in and wrap myself in your blanket. Oh my God, this food looks so good. Are you married? Oh my. Well-rounded individual. Y'all see my comments, bro. Y'all see my comments, right? The women folk love me, dog. <laughs> the women folk love me. Why? Because I'm intelligent. I know how to cook. I'm working on cleaning, buddy. You know what I'm saying? The ADHD be sabotaging me, you feel me? But I am extremely intelligent. I read constantly. I always have another conversation to have or always have another topic to bring up with these women, right? Well, not anymore because I'm moving from a place of ethical non-monogamy to a place of conscious monogamy. But once again, back in my heyday, I've had multiple conversations with multiple women and they're just looking at me like, and I'm like, yo, are, are you okay? You 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 straight? Like, you, you want to, like, come on, have this conversation with me. They're like, 
No, I just want to listen to you talk. Enthralled, my boy. Enthralled. You hear what I'm saying? Right? A lot of men believe that all women want is money. Bro. Bro. If I could tell you how wrong that is. Right? But once again, a lot of y'all have allowed social media to traumatize you. A lot of you all have allowed social media to tell you that this is how it is that you get or obtain women. Right? A lot of you all have turned yourselves into dickheads because you believe that once again this is what women respond to oh women like men who gonna die to treat them like shit woo, woo, woo. Mm, no no women respect men who have their own boundaries and are able to communicate those boundaries it just looks like they're getting treated like shit that's what it looks like Right? Because it comes off as, oh, that man's being a dickhead. No. He's firmly affirming himself in that situation. He is, so a number of women will say, I like a man who's going to check me. Right? Jill Scott said, if you can talk to me like that, you can talk to me like that. If you can't talk to me like that, you can't talk to me like that. What that means is, is that if you as a man have your own things, you have your own premises. You have your own kingdom. And you are saying to this woman, I am not going to allow you to come here and believe that you are going to mess these things up. You are going to come here and do anything other than supplement the same way that I am supplementing you. This is going to be a very short conversation and an even shorter engagement. But once again, once again, you have to be well-rounded in order for a woman to perceive you as somebody to be respected. And a number of you all are not well-rounded, right? A number of you all believe that all I got to do is this, this, and this, and these women will come flocking to me or these women want to stay. No, brother, that comes from that trauma, Right? That comes from the perception that men with more money and men with, they just have more options. Right? It just means that more women are presenting themselves to this man. And that does not necessarily mean that these women are good women. A lot of those women are empty minded. They have absolutely nothing other to, they have nothing other to offer than their physicality. And that's how they exist. Right? Now, for my women folk, I only know one woman, one, one, where a man was delivered to her doorstep by God, and that was my professor from undergrad. That woman is legally blind, so God had to help her, had to. <laughs> that is the only woman that I know who, after she prayed for him, God Amazon, Amazon delivered that man to her doorstep. But once again, that woman is legally blind. Right? A lot of you all as my women folk have experienced a lot of relationship trauma. I will not remove this from y'all. Right? Y'all have experienced a lot of real life trauma. I will not remove this from y'all. Right? At the same time and of the same token, continuing to test, continuing to manipulate, continuing to not communicate, continuing to withdraw from men who are genuinely attempting to engage with you is a form of self-sabotage. I'm going to say it one more time. Continuing to test, continuing to manipulate, continuing to withdraw from, and continuing to, once again, shortchange. Men who are genuinely attempting to engage with you is a form of self-sabotage, right? Also, adhering to these patriarchal gen oh, I'm not going to chase no man. I'm not going to walk up to no man and ask him. Self-sabotage. Self-sabotage. I got a homegirl who liked this man. Told me multiple ways to Sunday, I like this man, I like this man, I like this man. Did you tell him? 
Oh no, I don't want I don't uh huh. What if this man is just as nervous to approach you as you are to approach him? Right? Oh ah, I, I eat a jean jacket with barbecue sauce and onions before I ask a man on a date, self sabotage. Right? Oh ah, 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 rake ah rake leaves with a fork on a wet ground before I buy a man a drink, self sabotage. Self-sabotage. You are just as afraid of rejection as that man is. You just believe that because you're a woman, you shouldn't have to deal with it. Mm. You might need to remove your approach from patriarchal standards in order to get the man that you are looking for. You may have to try a different approach. Right? You may have to be in such a way where you are more vulnerable. Not put yourself in danger. Right? But remove yourself from the prevailing narrative on social media that men, most men, behave in these particular ways. Now, give me a moment. Right? <laughs> because sometimes even within myself, I got to say to myself, like, yo, some of y'all are real foolish. And when I say y'all, I mean men. Some of these men are real foolish. Right? But there are others, there are other men who would be more than willing to pay to go out with you. There are other men that are more than willing to do what it is that you are asking them to do. Are you willing to compromise with this man? I'm not saying have sex with him. I'm not saying do anything outside of what it is. To, but once again, if this man meets all of your needs, are you willing to compromise with him? Right? Are you willing to engage with him on a deeper level than just, oh, X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C? Are you willing to not necessarily suspend, but be less reactive when he does something that you don't like? Right? So a lot of, a number of women I've seen, what will happen is, is that they get hit with the, it's too good to be true. And then as soon as something happens, they immediately want to run in the other direction, run for the hills, because I knew this nigga was too good to be true. Whoa. Whoa. <clears throat> is there a deal breaker in this dynamic? Is there a deal breaker in this dynamic? If not, you are responding from a place of trauma. You are waiting for the other shoe to drop. You are thinking, man, I was reading a BuzzFeed article and it was real funny. This woman said, for the first five years I was dating my husband, I thought he was full of shit because he was just too nice. You wouldn't have made it five years with me. I'm sorry. You would not have. Would not have been the move, baby. You wouldn't have made it, right? Because there's no way in hell that you are going to, once again, place me in a space where you believe that me being the genuine gentleman that I am is performative because you used to dealing with ain't shit niggas. I didn't have to check a myriad of women about that. A multitude. Stop making me responsible. For the things that other people have done. And ultimately. I believe that's a great note to close on. In a lot of our relationship dynamics. In a lot of our. Dating expectations. In the contemporary dating pool. Right now. Is married folk. Is folk who. Being. Mm, 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 non-ethically non-monogamous is folks who cheating is folks who but there are still very real very single people who are looking for genuine connections not just sex not just no they're there and they're out there are we making them responsible for the things that other people have done to us both man and woman right for the fellas are you asking for way too much or way too, like, are, are you asking for too much up front? 
Are on you on the first date? Are you attempting to evaluate whether or not this woman is gonna cook, clean, X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C? Right? Because you you were so used to neglectful partners in the past, right? Are you trying to figure out whether or not she goes to the clubs and she X, Y, Z? Because that's something that in your mind makes her a bad partner, brother. If y'all are in y'all anywhere from mid to late twenties, they're gonna want to go somewhere. They're gonna want to go out every once in a while. How does that make them a bad partner, right? For my ladies, are you looking for this man to check every single one of your boxes? And if he doesn't, then you get the ick. You need to manage your expectations, right? Are you ready to run for the hills as soon as something gives you some type of apprehension or some type of pause? That's a form of self-sabotage because, once again, you're waiting for this other shoe to fall, right? Are you engaging in different types of manipulation or are you dropping hints or are you not allowing yourself to tell this man how it is that you really feel because you believe that women shouldn't do that? You are adhering yourself to patriarchal standards that are shooting you in the foot. With all of these things being said, we, a lot of us, are making this person that we barely know that we are attempting to get to know. That we are hoping that turns out to be a great person. Responsible for things that people in the past have done. Whether it be our parents. Whether it be previous partners. Whether it be the things that we've learned on the internet, on TV, what have you. We are making this person responsible. For things that we have experienced. Right? So, Odie, how do we navigate these waters a bit differently? I'm going to tell y'all what it is that I tell my clients. Number one, evaluate your needs, your wants, and desires in relationships. What are your needs? And your needs are your non-negotiables. Needs, non-negotiables, and boundaries, I'm not going to say they all go into the same category, but they are, they are, they are very similar to one another, Right? Your needs, your non-negotiables, and your boundaries. This is what I need in my relationship to feel safe. This is what I will not tolerate to not be destabilized. And this is how it is that I would like to express my deep wants in my relationships. Right? So needs, boundaries, and desires. When we get to the point of wants... This is where we may have to begin compromising, right? Because you're not, it is, it is an extremely low probability that you're going to get everything that you want in your relationship. This is, how, this is how you land back on your needs, your non-negotiables, and your desires. Does this person, at the very least, meet anywhere between 75 to 80% of these things? In my mind, 60% is an F. We're not looking for Fs. We're looking for B pluses and above. Do they meet 75 to 80% of what these things are? Right? You have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn how to speak. You have to learn how to navigate emotional intelligence in such a way where you can regulate yourself and not attempt to control somebody else because you are dysregulated. So if that's not something that you have mastered or if that's not something that you feel as if though you are great at, my suggestion is to either stick with friends with benefits or do not attempt to engage in long-term relationships because midway through that, somebody's going to piss you off and you're going to dysregulate and disrupt everything. So once again, do you know how to regulate yourself? Do you understand your triggers? Do you know what your glimmers are? Do you know what your love languages are? Do you know what your apology languages are? Right? These all go into emotional intelligence, emotional awareness, and communication. Right? And finally, and in my mind, this is the most important aspect. Is this person willing to grow, to learn, and to understand with you? We have a tendency to believe that we are going to be the same person here as we are here, and we are not. Your needs will change. Your desires will change. Your wants will change. Your communication styles will change. 
Your person will change. Is this person showing that they are capable of learning, growing, and expanding with you? Right? If so, you might have gotten one. You might have gotten one, right? If not, baby, you may need to keep searching. You dig what I'm saying? But ultimately, all of this, all of it, requires unpacking that baggage, baby. All of this requires digging deep into your luggage and seeing what is in it, right? Unfolding some of the dirty laundry, right? Unpacking some of these bags, leaving some of these bags. Switching out some of this luggage. You may not need all these clothes. You might just need an overnight bag. A spending night bag. You dig what I'm saying? You have to learn how to pack light. You have to learn how to pack light. Right? So before we end, I'm going to give y'all something that my mama gave me and my cousin. You know what I'm saying? Shout out DJ Louise. Shout out mommy. I love my mommy. Right? My mother says that everybody has luggage. Everybody has luggage. In their closet, in their house, in their room, everybody has luggage. It does not become baggage until you start carrying it. Ooh. My mama will be dropping bars, y'all. Y'all don't even know. I'm going to say that one more time. Right? Everybody has luggage. You got luggage in your closet. You got luggage in your crib. You got luggage in your room. It does not become baggage until you decide to carry it. Right? But, good people, great people, guys, people. I don't know if that YouTube stream came back on, but if it didn't, hey, y'all, we got the recording. So we're going to throw it up on YouTube. You dig what I'm saying? It's going to be on here probably like midnight or one o'clock or some shit like that. So if y'all want to watch the replay, it's going to be on YouTube. For my folks on Instagram, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in with me. Shout out Stormy. What up, Stormy? Hey, go follow Stormy. She's the person who I referenced earlier in the episode. Yay. The person who said uh, for them lady folks, you know what I'm saying, if he over 6'1", got a pretty smile on the beard, all your standards go out the window. Yeah, that was Miss Stormy, the host of the Chocolate Chip and Sip podcast. Y'all go follow her immediately. If you in my live stream, go follow her immediately. But um, as I said previously, peace, love, soul, and butter rolls. I'll see y'all next time. Peace.